Hi. In this lecture, what I want to do is I want to talk about what culture is and why we care about culture. Now, before I go into this, let me be really clear. I'm trained as a mathematical economist and a game theorist. I'm not a cultural anthropologist nor am I a sociologist. And so I'm a little bit outside my main area of expertise here. And culture itself has hundreds of definitions. In fact, if you pick up some cultural anthropology books, what they'll do is they'll begin with a litany of all these different definitions that people have thrown out there. And at first you can look at this and think, oh my gosh, this is confusing. Doesn't anybody know what culture is? Well, the reality is that they do, but culture is such a complex thing, it's such an interesting thing, that no simple definition can capture it. And so as a result, to really understand what culture is, it actually makes sense to look at lots of definitions. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to start out by just looking at sort of historically some of the definitions of culture that have been out there to try and give us some understanding of what it is. Then we're going to look at how social scientists have tried to quantify it, how to take something really abstract, like this notion of culture, these many notions of culture, and turn them into something measurable so we can compare across countries and then see the effects. Because when we think about what culture is, we want to ask sort of why it's important. Why are we spending our time constructing models of it? And that's what we're going to get to. We're going to see that culture matters a lot for the success of countries. Okay, so let's get started. What is culture? So Tyler, who many people think is sort of the father of modern cultural anthropology, said that culture is the complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, law, morals, and customs. So what he thinks of it is a sort of complex, really, entirety of human existence. All the beliefs, laws, customs, morals, and things that you see that vary across different countries. So that's sort of an opening definition of culture. It really sort of defines the field. Now after that, a guy named Franz Boas sort of extends this, and he thinks about it as sort of mental and physical reactions. And Boas is the first one that really sort of gets across this idea that there should be some consistency across these mental and physical reactions to the world. Now that consistency could be partly brought on by the environment you're in, or it could be socially constructed. But the idea is that there's sort of some consistency as well in the behaviors and actions that people take. Okay, difficulty though <laughs> with these definitions is they're pretty dry and they're pretty academic and they really don't give you a sense of exactly what culture would be. So for example, when you see things like behavioral responses to the environment, what exactly does that mean? That sounds sort of like academic jargon. So one thing that's nice about the cultural literature is that people who are writers, people who spend their time not being academics but writing about the world, social commentators, have also written definitions of culture. So let's look at one of those. This is from uh, Calvin Trilling from 1955. When we look at people to the degree of abstraction which the idea of culture implies, we cannot but be touched and impressed by what we see. We cannot help but be awed by something mysterious at work, some creative power which seems to transcend any particular act or habit or quality that may be observed. To make a coherent life, and here again we see this notion of consistency, to confront the terrors of the outer and the inner world. Isn't that beautiful? It's just wonderful. To establish the ritual and art, the pieties and duties which make possible the life of the group and the individual, these are culture. And to contemplate these various enterprises which constitute a culture is inevitably moving. I think he's spot on here. And I really like this idea of which make possible the life of the group and the individual. What he's basically saying, in order for groups and individuals to function, they have to have some similarities within. We have to agree or coordinate on certain sets of behaviors, understandings, morals, laws, customs, in order to confront the inner and outer terrors of our lives, right? So it's a great idea. Now the interesting thing about culture is we don't all do this in the same way. Hence, there are differences between the cultures. So how people in one country or one interacting group behave is different than in another country. This is true even at the firm level. If you go visit different companies, you'll notice that different companies or different organizations also have different cultures. And those behaviors are also often interesting. And by that I mean they can be seemingly odd or suboptimal or seem like they don't even perform the function you'd like them to perform and we'll talk about why that's the case as well through these lectures. Let's start though by just looking at what these differences are, how extreme these differences can be. So here's an experiment that was done, this is actually a set of experiments coordinated by Joe Henrich, Sam Bowles, Gene Ensminger, a whole bunch of social scientists and what they did is they played a game, the same game, in a whole bunch of different societies. So here's the game, it's called the ultimatum game. Player one is given $10. And then they're, they're told to offer a split to player two. So maybe $5 a piece, and maybe they give player two a dollar, <laughs> they give player two a penny. 
Player two can either accept or reject. If player two accepts the money, then they split it, right? So if player two accepts, they get the split. So if player one offers player two $5 and player two says, great, they each take their $5. If player two says no, they both get nothing. They get absolutely nothing. So what player one has to do is player one has to figure out what's the minimum amount I can offer player two for them to accept it so they both get the money. What's interesting is that the idea here is to play this across a whole bunch of different cultures, different groups, and see, do people play it the same way? And the answer was that they don't. So there's a group called the Lamalera. There's a group called the Lamalera who are Indonesian whale hunters. So they hunt whales collectively. Now another group that they studied was called the Machiganga, who are an Amazonian group. And these Amazonian people, they didn't even have proper names. So it was much more sort of, you know, personal, selfish sort of world than in the La Malera, where there's a lot of cooperation going on. So the question then is, how do these two groups play in the ultimatum game? Well, it shouldn't be a huge surprise that what happened is the La Malera offered 570, more than half. And the Machiganga offered only 270, or 260, I'm sorry, you know, almost approximately a quarter. So what we see is massive differences between these two groups and how much they offered the other people as a function of what their cultures were. So this is one way that social scientists are trying to measure cultural differences by going into different places, running experiments, and seeing if those experiments differ. Another way we do it is through survey research. So this is a graph that was constructed by my colleague Ron Engelhart, who spent decades surveying people all over the world, doing something called the World Value Survey, and then takes these survey responses and uses something, um, sort of a variant of factor analysis, to figure out what are the relevant dimensions of different cultures. And what he finds, and this is what's fascinating, is you can really have just two dimensions to separate most cultures. And that is, the first one is survival self-expression. So on this axis, sort of on the left-hand side over here, it's are you survival-based. You know, you're just trying to get food. And over here, are you more self-expressive? You worry about like, what your hair looks like, or are these cool glasses, something like that. And the other axis you can ask, is it traditional, sort of more religious, or you know, that way, or is it more secular rational? And you can divide countries in these two ways. And what's interesting is if you take all this data from all these surveys and then plot it on these two dimensions using factor analysis, you get that the whole world sort of makes sense by geography. You get Protestant Europe up here in the sort of self-expressive secular realm. You get Islamic and African countries down here more towards the religious and survival based. And you get the sort of Confucian countries over here in the survival based rational and then you get Latin America in the sort of self-expressive religious space. So what you see is the whole world, so with Catholic Europe, of course, being right in the center. So what you get is you get this approach, surveying people, using factor analysis to decide where they go, ends up making a lot of sense of the world. You see the world geographically maps into these two dimensions. If you look at this map, it would make you think that everybody from Sweden is here, and everybody from New Zealand is here, and everybody from Zimbabwe is down here. That's not quite true. And a way to think of this is to take an idea from biology. So if you take a biology course, your professor might say something like, there is no great blue heron. <laughs> what do they mean by that? What they mean by that is that what we call a great blue heron is really an entire population of birds. So it's an entire population of things that we call great blue herons. So every time a great blue heron is born, every time a great blue heron dies, what it means to be a great, great blue heron changes. So if this is the set of great blue herons, if I wipe this red one out, what it means to be a great blue heron is now different. If I add another great blue heron in here, then what's going to happen? So if I start drawing in new great blue herons, then what it's going to mean is what it means to be a great blue heron is now somehow different. So you should think of the same thing of these people on Ingohart's map. What it means to be from Sweden or Zimbabwe isn't just a point, but there's a whole population of people. And you can see that. Ron was nice enough to sort of share his data that generates this chart. Here's what Sweden actually looks like. It's a giant cloud of people. It's not just one point. And here's what Zimbabwe looks like. Again, it's a cloud of people. It's not just one point. But if you look at these two things, you notice there's very little overlap between Sweden and Zimbabwe. So there's a difference between someone from Sweden and someone from Zimbabwe. But there's also differences within the Swedish people and differences within the people from Zimbabwe. So there is no Swedish person per se, just like there's no great blue heron. So there's a population of people that we call Swedish. Inglehart isn't the only person that maps out cultures according to dimensions. There's a guy named Hirt Hofstede who 
really focuses more on the business world than, you know, just broadly speaking, society. And he has five dimensions that he uses to make sense of different cultures. These include power distance, like how much inequality are you willing to accept, uncertainty avoidance, individualism, individualism how collectivist or individualistic are you, how masculine are you, and how, you know, sort of what he calls Confucianism, dynamism, in terms of how forward-looking are you. And so if you take Hofstede's measures, what you can do is you can look up, he's got a you know, web page for this, you can look up every country, and it'll tell you sort of how they map out. Let's just look at four of the dimensions, because you know, keep things simple. So the United States on power distance is really low, which means that we're willing to tolerate a lot of inequality. On individualism, we're really high. On masculinity, we're pretty high. And on uncertainty avoidance, we're actually you know, fairly low. We're, not, we're willing to you know, take on a lot of uncertainty. If you contrast us with France, you'll see that France is less willing to accept inequality. They've got a higher power distance number. They're less masculine, and they're much more uncertainty avoidant. Now, the sort of fun thing, if you've been to a country, and then you think of these different dimensions, and you go look up the dimensions on Hofstede's webpage, you'll see, wow, it, sort of, it looks sort of what I expect, which is good, because it means that he's actually capturing something that makes sense. But when you do this, when you plot countries on two dimensions, or if you do what Hofstede does, plot them on four dimensions, you can't capture everything, and that's why culture has all these darn definitions. So, for example, here's El Salvador and Korea, according to Hofstede. Now, the numbers 6256, 1211, 4133, 8080 are pretty darn similar. But if you've been to El Salvador, if you've been to Korea, you'll notice that those are very different countries. And so, even with, you know, Engelhardt has two, Hofstede has four or five, country, two or three measures aren't going to capture all the differences, all the richness, nor will one definition. Why do we care, though? So what? So cultures differ. It's a fun thing to think about. You know, so do the patterns on different couches or you know, paint colors on walls. Why do we care about culture? The reason we care about culture, and here's a you know, quote from Ken Arrow, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, is when you think about how the economy works, how political systems work, how society works, it's all mediated through these social exchanges. So as um, Arrow says in this quote, that a lot of economic backwardness can be explained by lack of mutual confidence, so lack of trust. So one of the things that we see in cultures is different levels of trust. And different levels of trust have huge implications for how well political, economic, social, and religious institutions are going to perform in terms of meeting the needs of the citizens. So if you think about how well a people are doing, it often depends on trust, and trust is one component of culture. Now, there's a problem here, though, is that it's easy to say trust. And Bob Solo, who's another Nobel Prize winner in economics, who we've seen before, remember the growth model, Solo says, look, that's great. I totally buy into these notions of trust and social capital and all that sort of stuff that's important for culture. But we need to measure it in some way. It can't just be a metaphor. It's got to be measurable. And that's, one, again, one of the reasons why we have models to be able to measure these things, make sense of things, so that we can see how they work. And that's what Engelhardt's up to, in a way. And that's what Hofstede's up to. They're trying to measure cultural differences. How do they do it? How does Engelhardt do it? How do you measure something like trust? Well, these are some questions. Do you do the following? Do you claim government benefits which you're not entitled to? <laughs> yes or no? Do you avoid a fare on public transport? Do you sneak on the public buses and trains? Do you cheat on your taxes? Do you keep money if you found it? Do you fail to report damage you've done accidentally to a parked vehicle? You can ask these sort of questions, and these sort of questions will get it. How trusting are people within a society? Or you can just ask this question. Generally speaking, do you think people can be trusted? So this is a question that Ron asks. Here's what's interesting. You see massive differences across countries. So for example, in Sweden, remember, way up to the right, 70% of people say, yes, I think people can be trusted. In Italy, it's 33%. And in Turkey, it's only 10%. So what you see is huge differences of, do you think people can be trusted? Well, think about it for a minute. That's going to affect how well the economy is going to work. If I'm going to enter in a business deal with you and I think there's only a 10% chance I can trust you, then I'm much less likely to enter that deal. Or if I think there's a 70% chance you can be trusted, I'm more willing to have a flexible arrangement. So society is just going to work. Economics exchange is just going to work a lot better in a country with a high level of trust. Does it matter? Does trust matter? Well, if you've got all this data on levels of trust, you've also got data on GDP, you can ask, do they correlate? Do trust and GDP correlate? Well, Here's the percentage of people having a high level of trust, and here's median GDP. And if you look at this graph, here's the data, you see huge upward slope. Now, we've got to be careful. Remember, because we talked about the difference between just correlation and a causal relationship. This could be like the equestrian club. It could be once you've got high GDP, it makes sense to start trusting. 
That's absolutely true. That's something we've got to flesh this out a little bit more. But what's clearly true is that high levels of trust correlate with high GDP. So high GDP countries are high trust countries. So that's one reason among many why culture matters and why we're interested in culture. But another reason is just because it is interesting. It's this mystery. You go out there and you look around the world and you see all these differences across all these peoples. It'd be nice to understand what's going on there. Why is that the case? How do we get these differences between and similarities within? And why is, it some, of it, why is some of it interesting? That's what we want to understand. And that's what we're going to do when we start looking at these pure coordination models. We're going to start trying to explain why cultures look like they do. Okay, thanks.